Obayome Mohamed Hussein was born on the 22nd of April 1904 in Dar es Salaam, Germany, South Africa. Bayome Mohamed Hussein was the son of a Sudanese professional soldier in the German Colonial Army of German East Africa or the Schutztruppe or the Colonial Polizei, and of course to a local woman. Shortly after the outbreak of the First World War at the age of just 10, Hussein joined the German Colonial Army as a child soldier. The main tasks of child soldiers were carrying guns to and from the front lines and acting as singulars in the field, operating the heliograph. Although they were euphemistically called the single troops apprentices or the single schutzla, their assignments were actually very dangerous. According to his own testimony, Hussein was wounded in October 1917 at Mihawa in one of the bloodiest battles on African soil until the Congo crisis of the 1990s and was imprisoned by the British for an unknown period of time. His father was sadly killed in combat. When German East Africa later became Tanganyika and then Tanzania, Hussein, like many other African veterans, failed to establish a new livelihood in this pro-Germanic colony. He signed on as a steward on several German ships but finally migrated to Berlin in 1929. When he tried to collect his outstanding service pay, he was told that the fund had already been closed. Through his contacts with former German colonial officers though, he found work as an exotic waiter at the House of Waterland where he worked for five years at the World West Bar. At the same time, he was employed as a Kiswali teacher at the Berlin University, a job which he held for the next 10 years. During his university employment, he also served as a language informant for several German scholars. Hussein mainly thought future colonial officers and thus took an active part in the colonial revisionist movement, which advocated and worked for the revitalization of the lost colonies of 1919. So during the early 1930s, Hussein was the token devoted former Askari, as the African soldiers of German East Africa or any African colony were called at that point. At innumerable events of the revisionist scene, which offered a home for him, his role was to demonstrate to the general public that the Askari had been loyal to the German officers until the end, and that the former colonial subjects longed for the return of German colonial masters. He seems in several photographs seem to show, done so with a certain pride, but compared to the British and the Belgians and the French, were the Germans really any worse? So from 1934, he worked as an actor in more than 20 films. His first role was actually in a colonial revisionist movie called Die Rote von Deutsches Ostafrika, or The Troopers of German East Africa. He's one of the few actors of color to have a speaking part in several movies. Hussein even had his own autograph card made, which depicts him in his film uniform and identifies him as a former Askari in the Schutztruppe in the reverse. In 1932, Hussein dated two German women who simultaneously became pregnant with his first two children. He married one of them, Maria Schandewandener, in 1933, three days before the Nationalist Socialistic Deutsches Aberpartei, or the Nazi Party, came to power under Adolf Hitler. His sons, Heinz Bodo and Hamed Adam, were born within six weeks of each other. Heinz Bodo, who was his illegitimate son, seems to have been adopted by Hussein and his wife and stayed with the family until his death in 1945. A girl named Anna Marie was born in 1936 as the family were struggling to make ends meet. It was the Great Depression, but Hussein was lucky to be employed most of the time, but his excessive lifestyle and affairs made it difficult for his wife to support the family. Two of his children died shortly after the outbreak of the Second World War. Anna Marie Hussein from 1936 to 1940, Hamed Adam from 1933 to 1938, and Heinz Bodo, the one that will live the most, 1933 to 1945. Rest in peace. Like many migrants from the former German colonies, Hussein was given a passport of endorsement or the Deutsche Schusterbundfoldener, which was not equivalent to a full citizenship, but in World War I, post World War I Europe, it was as close as you're gonna get. So after the war and more so after Hitler's rise to power, Africans from the former colonies were regarded as the nationals of the state that has succeeded Germany as the colonial power. Most of the Africans in Germany and the black Germans and their family members had to exchange their papers for alien passports, which had to be renewed every year without fail. Failing to do so in time, Hussein and his wife were convicted of the worst crime imaginable in ja Nazi Germany, passport fraud. Although Hussein had never applied for German citizenship, 
All evidence points to him identifying as a German. He was constantly in dispute with the German authorities not only over financial support, but also over his recognition as a World War I combatant. He saw himself entitled to receive the medal. He saw himself entitled to receive the Medal of Honor or the Front Kampfer Gazbund Jenschen, which could be awarded to any frontline veteran from any theater of war, and applied for it several times. With his applications, he initiated a discussion among the several administrative bodies about whether or not the medal should be awarded to a non-white combatant. The authorities even asked for the advice from Paul von Lettard of Wordovic, the former commander of East African forces in the region. He was also presenting himself as a special friend of the Ascari. The latter took the view that the African combatant should not have any claim to the decoration and the authorities finally decided that the medal should be reserved for the white combatants only. It is a demonstration of Hussein's agency that he apparently bought himself a medal from a military supply shop and pinned it to his uniform and wore it at revisionist events and photographs show him wearing it proudly. Wish you should buddy. That, that shit belongs to you. And I like how the Germans are like, he has a Hunter Kampfer Bond Jashenshin. How, how, he's not even white. What is going on here? But he's at Ascari though, eh? In 1939, shortly after the British and French declared war on Germany, well, against Germany, Hussein asked to be accepted into the Wehrmacht to show that he was not a child soldier, but his admission was denied. In 1941, Hussein was denounced to the Nazi authorities and accused of miscongeneration, as he was a well-known figure with the authorities and had the unwaveringly refused to comply with the image of the grateful and subservient subject fighting for his rights instead. There was no one in the university or within the colonial revisionist or revenge of Christ movement who came to his support. Hussein was transported to the Schachenhausen concentration camp without trial in September 1941. He succeeded in surviving in the inhumane living conditions with the camp for three years, but finally died on the 24th of November 1944. In September 2007, Mohammed Hussein Bayome, became the first African to be given a memorial as a Nazi victim of terror, a Schlopenstein or a bronze statue or a bronze stumbling block or a bronze stumbling block was set in the grounds in front of his last address in Berlin before he was sold away. And that is the man, the myth, the coon, the black guy who fought for his rights in the end, Bayomer Mohammed Hussein. Rest in peace, brother. So anyway, this is an interesting case study about world stinted glasses, nostalgia, neo-colonialists, and of course, Germany's trying to replicate trying to really replicate the Second Reich, but being the Third Reich. Even the flag shows it with the black swastika, the white um, round, drill, round drill, which is the round thing, and the red flag. The primary colors of the German Empire's flag and what you see in all of my videos, unless it's something about the Navy, which is white with the eagle, or the Air Force, which is the round drill with the eagle. Anyway guys, hope you enjoyed, hope you learned something, and I tell you the real shit. Don't trip. Learn something. No slip. Drip drip. Karen slip. So in 1934, Hussein briefly returned to Tanganyika during the production of the film Die Rota von Deutsches Ost Afrika, in which he had a minor role, his actual minor role. Thereafter, Hussein lost his main income as a waiter at the House of Atalan, the Pleasure Palace, the Pleasure Palace in 1935 after being dismissed due to the racial compliance of the co-workers. He allegedly also had to undergo conflicts with Frederick Coelho's Universitat Thraham Fund Orientally Spartan in Berlin, or the uh, Frederick Wilhelm University for the Studies of Orientalist Studies in Berlin, which he had to help teach the Swahili to the police officers, being ready to serve in the regaining of German colonies after the anticipated war victory or even the event of the unlikely reversal of the colonial clause in the Treaty of Versailles. In 1936, Hussein joined the Deutsches Afrika Schloss, a sort of human zoo created by the German Foreign Office as part of the campaign for the return of former German colonies. The Foreign Office wanted to use the Afro-Germans to urge against the foreign claims that doubted Nazi Germany's ability to administer the colonies. 
Other parts of the Nazi regime tried to use foreign colonial troops during the occupation of the Rhineland and the Battle of France as the propaganda tool they needed. From 1939 to 1941, Hussein appeared in at least 23 German films, generally regarded as an extra or minor or even a speaking role. Of course, his last and most prominent role was the Rammenstein, the native guide to the German colonial leader and mad dog of German East Africa, Karl Peters, and the 1941 film of the same name. He stopped working at the university in 1941, allegedly after being mistreated by Martin Hipp, an Africanist and linguistic expert. While on, set, he engaged in an while on set, he engaged with an affair with a German woman and was reported to the authorities, so that's how the charge of Mishcon generation started. And of course he was arrested by the Discapo. Of course he was arrested by the Discapo and was charged with racial defamation or Mishcon generation and detained without trial to the slashing house in concentration camp. So his legacy is kind of myth, but like I said, it might end before I add, add tatted this on because this is some interesting stuff. I know Wikipedia is not bad, but this is some good stuff. But anyway, the Stoffenstein, blah, 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 Majabu, Ish von Ivan Kofin, which is a documentary, was actually about his life. So I might even like that. So there you go. But anyway. We're just gonna be here. This is mostly just the films he's been in since 1934. So anyway, Die Rote von Deutsche Ostafrika, 1934. In 1937, Two New Shores. In 1937, Schuss Cabin 7. 1938, Der Umlicher Pit. 1938, Five Million to Look for and Hear. 1938, Sergeant Barry. 1938, Faded Melody. 1939, Men Are That Way. 1940, The Star of Rio, 1941, Pedro Will Hang, and 1941, Carlo Peters. Anyway guys, a difficult legacy. Was he a coon? Was he a mad dog? Was he a king? I think he was all of those, and just a bit of a fronter camper as well. He was our king, our legend, our yes master. He was a man who had the rose tinting glasses, and he rode the waves of Germans being being well blindsided by the Ascani, making a nice profit, being pretty cool. I don't know, man. It's one of those rose tinted glasses, nostalgia for the old colonial way, and the newfound cultural appropriation. And the new, you know, the new rose tinted glasses of he was a coon this whole time, guys. Nah, he wasn't. He was a king, he was a man larger than life, he was a pimp, he was a warlord. He was a child soldier. Corny 1914. He was by your mayor Mohammed Hussein. Anyway, guys, thank you for watching. Anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned something. And I'll see you next time in the shores of Japan. That was just jibber jabber. Anyway, enjoy. Learn something, guys. Stay safe. Wash your ass.